care. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. How is everyone? That wasn't very good, but good morning. How is everyone? That's better. I learned that from him. All right. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil the victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. wider the snow there's power in the blood power in the blood sin stains are lost in its life giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the land there is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation swords, where could I go but to the
our kind. I love them, everyone. We get along in sweet accord. But when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. And needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? to help me in the end where could I go but to the Lord amen oh you're gonna sit in the chief's chair today I see <laughs> Amen. That's all right. We can all cut up because he's not here today. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. Amen. Amen. How are we doing this morning? Amen. You know, I hope Carl is watching because I saw Diana come in this morning. I said, Diana, how's it going this week? Are you doing okay? She goes, it's been nice and peaceful. <laughs> I think she brought the remote with her today. She says she's got to hold it for the last four days since Carl's been gone. I did warn everybody, though. I said she might have brought her tambourine today since... Since Carl's gone, but harmonica. and the harmonica, good. <laughs> well, we're blessed to be here this morning, brother. Would you open us with a prayer? Yeah. Scott Bowser, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We're so blessed to be able to come together today, spend some time with our church family, spend some time in your presence, uh, to hear the message that's been pre prepared for us today. And Father, we pray that we can take that message from here and, and share it with others. And Father, we thank you for the the perfect sacrifice that was made, so that we could be forgiven and that uh, we can share in the great future that you've got planned for each and every one of us. And Father, we know that if we just put our trust in you, we'll never be disappointed. And we also know, Father, that your faithfulness has no limits. And we just pray that you would help us to, to live by that example, to do our best to live by that example each and every day. Father, be with those that are sick and, and ill, and, and just give them comfort, give them strength. And be with those that aren't here today and bring us all back together next week. Thank and praise and ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to read to you from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 20 and 21. It says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I wish, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish, lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceit, tumults, lest when I come again my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness which they have practiced. And here Paul, he makes a list of, of a bunch of sins and attitudes, which includes uh, quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. And Paul's telling them that I don't, I don't want to find this stuff when I come back and visit with you next time. And it, I started thinking about this, and, and those of you that have cattle, you know, in the morning, you get up, and you go out and check your pasture, go out to the pasture and check the cows, and, you know, here lately, those have been some pretty nice mornings, uh, but when you get there, you find that the bulls have been fighting, they tore down the fence, uh, several of the cows are out on the roadway, one of them's eating something poisonous, and they're sick, uh, the stray calves have wandered off into somebody else's pasture, and you sit there and look at it, and you wonder, you know, why in the world could, did they do this? How could this possibly be? I give them good pasture, I give them the best grazing, I give them the best care, you know, why don't they recognize just how good they've got it? Well, we, I think you probably know that in this, in this picture, we're the cattle, you know. Uh, God's provided us, he always provides us with everything we need, and he always provides us with more than we need. And I think it's important that when we uh, start feeling these emotions that we described earlier today, and you know, we raise our head up and we look at all the green grass that God's given us. I think it's important that when God looks into our pastures, he sees us where we're supposed to be, doing
doing what we're supposed to be doing. Amen. Yeah. Uh, Jeff and I have talked about this. He's preached about it. Uh, and when, but when we finish our day and we're thinking about the mistakes we've made, the wrongs that we've done, instead of you know kicking ourselves and beating ourselves down and getting depressed and mad about it, what we really need to do is just ask God to help us be better tomorrow. Amen. You know, uh, if you're like me, that's going to give you peace. You're going to sleep a lot better. And when I do that, I get excited knowing that tomorrow morning I'm going to walk with God, and I can't wait to see what he's got planned for me. Amen. Amen. You get, you get up a lot quicker than Carl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I might be the only one that dislikes tambourines as much as Carl does. <laughs> and it reminded me of a story whenever you said that. Um, <laughs> hey, Diana, one Sunday we're going to bring time. I'll, beca- I'll bring one. <laughs> hey, I oh, I have the no- <laughs> Listen, I'll glue, I'll glue the little symbols together. <laughs> we were uh, <laughs> growing up in our family church. Me and my family played, you know, and we had this one lady that would play. And it was so bad. I hope she's not ever watching this. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, so it was so bad to throw the band off. And one day me and my brother hit it and she was looking for a tambourine, you know, and a few Sundays went by and finally in the middle of the sermon, she saw it and got up and got it. We had hit it in the tree. That was <laughs> the little <laughs> fixture up on stage. Anyway, I hope she's not watching this. <laughs> if you are, you know who did it. No, I didn't. <laughs> When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Ending the troubles and cares of the story land, won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burden to bear, Joyously singing with heart bells a ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there? Walking and talking with Christ the supernal one, won't it be wonderful there? Praising, adoring the matchless eternal one, won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there, having no burden to bear, joyously singing with heart bells a ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there, there where the tempest will never be sweeping us, won't it be wonderful there. Sure that forever the Lord will be keeping us. Won't it be wonderful there? Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burden to bear. Joyously singing with heart bells a ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Joyously singing with heart bells a ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there? Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, let's see. We've got a few announcements this morning, and if I forget any, y'all let me know. First off, if you're here visiting today, if, if you've just started coming, if you haven't filled out a visitor's card yet, if you would, please put your hand up. We'd like to have somebody bring you a visitor's card by. Also, <clears throat> we need a few people. Look, I'm going to remember, Miss Jade. We need a few people to help out with Children's Church in the back. So, Miss Jade, if you'd just kind of put your hand up or stand. There you go. Y'all, that is such an important job and a great opportunity because with everything that you see going on in the world today, I mean, what could be a bigger blessing and a bigger responsibility than sharing a message with our kids in the back? 
and you're getting a bunch of little sponges back there. They just they love to come in and get that message on Sunday mornings. And so if you feel it's on your heart, please volunteer. We need about three people. Oh, great. Larry's volunteering. <laughs> so as I was saying, almost everybody is welcome to help us back there in Jonah's. <laughs> anyway, but no, we you better be careful. I might put you back there. I know how you get around those kids. <laughs> we'll be counseling them for a month. Anyway, but we really would appreciate that. Uh, I, I want to let y'all know that the arena ministry is really just, it, it's getting big, y'all. Uh, Friday night, uh, Brother Mike went down. He was going to give us some, did you give a message on Friday night? A short one? I know it was a good one. But they had 42 teams down there. And then they came in and reported, this was for the team roping, that the next one is going to be way bigger. They had a lot more calls. Uh, it's going to be a lot bigger. And so they're going to start going on almost every Friday night. There's going to be team roping down here. So if you want to come by on a Friday night, watch, enjoy. You know, whoever one of us is down there giving a message, it's a great opportunity to come out and fellowship. We've got a lot of barrel racing going on on Thursday nights. They've, there's a big race coming up on the 6th of November. Uh, we've got, we are now the host for the Cook County 4-H, who every third Sunday is going to be doing their uh, equine program down in our arena. So it's a blessing because uh, as we had heard in this church, they did not have a place or arena to use last year. So we told them this is your home now. We want those kids down there. Uh, and then we've also got uh, some events coming up. We've got ranch cutting on the 23rd of, Octo 23rd of October, which is Saturday. And then Black Friday, which is the Friday after Thanksgiving. We've got a Friday-Saturday show. Uh, down there ranch cutting and we've got our favorite new caterer George and Cynthia they are incredible cooks it's worth coming up just to eat some of their food and they are also going to be catering our 10-year anniversary which will be Saturday October the 9th I want to remind y'all at six o'clock we've got a big barbecue going on and then we've got our incredible band is going to be up here with a country gospel concert that night don't just limit it to folks in the church invite everybody from the community it's a good time to come in and eat fellowship and listen to some incredible music and so uh you know it's kind of funny i probably said this before but carl said you want me to get some other acts to come in and we'll do this country gospel i said no man these guys are awesome we couldn't get any better than what we have here so we're looking forward to the incredible blessing that they're going to bring. So how many birthdays or anniversaries do we have coming up this week? Boy, y'all are guilty when you... I see her. Amber, she's got her birthday this week. Who else has got a birthday? No? Jean, you got one? You run out of them. I knew it. Sing happy birthday. A happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Uh, you weren't supposed to add that extra note. But. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, where are my kids? Do I got some kids this morning? I need, I need my kids down here. It's time for my favorite time of the morning. My goodness, where, did, did y'all run everybody off? The herd is small this morning. Do you know there's an old saying, if only half the herd shows, only give them half a sack. Y'all want the whole sack or the half sack? Half? Now you sound like Larry. My goodness. Well, that means y'all going to have to be extra loud since there's only five of us. So how are we doing this morning? No, no, no. Are y'all still asleep? Are we taking Sunday off? We need donuts. Give me sugar, quick. And a Red Bull. Then we send them home. How are we doing this morning? Can I help? Let's do it together. One, two, three. Bless. There we go. Well, that's better. So I got a question for you this morning. Do you ever wonder what's right or wrong? 
you don't, you just do the wrong thing anyway. You do the right thing, that's good. Are there any every, a time when you're like, oh, I wonder if that's the right thing or the wrong thing? Hmm. Or what about, have you ever heard somebody tell a lie? Oh, don't believe in him. He always does the right thing. That's right, right. We always do the right thing. Sometimes we hear things and we don't know if it's true or not. Or people might tell us how we're supposed to be living, and we're like, hmm, I wonder if that's true or not. Well, do you want to know how to always figure out if it's true? You do want to know, right? Right? You don't want to know? That's what I thought. Right here. Do you know in this big old book that God gave us, this is called God's Word, do you know that he tells us how to do everything the right way? Never a question that the Bible can't answer. And you know what the cool thing is? That if you have a question, and maybe if you can't read quite as good as you want to read yet, you're kind of like Larry in the back and reading's kind of tough, that you can ask your grandma or grandpa or parents or somebody that question, and they can go into this, and they can read you the answer. Isn't that cool? Isn't it good to know that no matter what question you ever have, you can find the answer right here in this book? Amen? Well, it sure was good to see you all this morning. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for giving me a book with the answers to everything. Amen. It was good to see you all this morning. Y'all better get some donuts on the way back. Well, he put my life back together. I turned it all over to climb. That things couldn't get any better. And he's having the time of my life. He's having the time of my life. And I'm loving him all of the time. But he gave me happiness and he took the stripe. And now he's having the time of my life. Walking in tall cotton, for I'm on top of the world, flying high. Because he picked me up off the bottom, and he's having the time of my life. Well, he's having the time of my life, and I'm loving him all of the time. He gave me happiness, and he took the stripe, and now he's having the time of my life. Well, he gave me happiness, but well, he took the strike, and now he's having the time of my life.
Amen. Boy, y'all just got me fired up and ready to go now. Might preach for an hour and a half. <laughs> Gosh, here I thought y'all were going with me on this deal. <laughs> Till we hit that hour mark, huh? Oh, you know, something I forgot to say this morning. I sure want to welcome everybody that's watching from home. We've got folks that are traveling, some folks that need to stay home. And we just want to say good morning to y'all. And, and as we all know here, you're just as much a part of the church family when you're sitting at home watching as you are when you're here. And it's a blessing to know that our brothers and sisters in Christ are at home and tuned in. And, and we just hope you're safe. And, and hopefully those of you that can come back to church at some time will get back because we'd love to see you and hug on you. Uh, but we're just glad that we have that opportunity. And we sure want to thank the folks that sit in the back that run the cameras and the, and the video and all that stuff every week. Because that's a ministry. You're getting the word out to a lot of folks, and we, we really appreciate that. You know, I started talking to the kids, and I know this is something that's on a lot of our minds, and, and I get a lot of emails and text messages from folks, and y'all can keep them coming. I, I appreciate that a lot of us struggle with, with different things going on in the world today. But I got to thinking this week, the word truth has become a word that seems to mean absolutely nothing in our society today. Boy, there's my amen section back here. Y'all, Wayne never says anything, and all I heard was, boy, y'all ain't kidding. <laughs> but look at the media. It seems to be absolutely impossible to read anything or hear anything that even resembles the truth. You know, last week, just an example here in Texas, the Border Patrol was tried and convicted for using whips on horses only to find out that they were bridle wearing. People had already bought into it too late. Government always can't save face. They have to continue a lie. Once again, where was the truth? You know, once it's out there, it always seems to be out there. And it doesn't seem like the truth is very attractive much anymore. You know, but on the flip side of that, if we're not careful, we can easily find ourselves doing the same thing with the Word of God. There's a lot of folks who have what they call their Christian opinions or convictions. Holier-than-thou opinions based on things that they just grew up hearing. I found out, Brother Doug King, if he's watching this morning, I hope he is, he's my mentor, one of them. He did a sermon, and I wish I would have written it down, or I wish I could remember it all. It was probably been 14 years ago that he did it. But he came in here, and he told all these biblical stories that we all heard when we were growing up. And I thought, oh, wow, I remember that, I remember that. And then he got to the end of these wonderful little stories. He goes, you know every one of those is a lie? He goes, not one of them was supported by the Word of God. And we were all kind of surprised. But that can happen if we rely on opinions and things we've heard based on going to the Word of God. And sometimes people get upset when you challenge their beliefs when it's not based on the Word of God. You know, I've heard people say, well, that's what I was told. Or I grew up hearing that. Or I don't have time to spend all day reading the Bible. Well, there's different interpretations for different scripture texts. Or the Bible's too hard to understand. So I got a couple questions that I want to ask. And I'm not picking on anybody because we all fall victim to this. But is the Bible written in a language that's too difficult to understand? Is it, is it too mystical? Is it so complicated that we just can't apply it to our lives? Do those excuses give us a pass for not taking the word exactly as God gives it? You know, I thought about that because, you know, when I was in college, statistics was like a foreign language to me. I actually dropped the class three different times before the first test just because I couldn't get it. But I realized that there wasn't a single excuse the teachers were going to take to pass me in that class. I just had to get into the book and learn what was in there. And, you know, whether it's a whether it's a denomination, whether it's a church or an individual, there's no excuse for not knowing the Word of God. 
and receiving the message that God has for us in the context that he has given us. That's one of the most important things, is taking the message of God in the context that he's given us. And I'll tell you what I think the biggest problem with the Word of God is for most people. It's not wishy-washy. It draws a line between God's truth and people's opinions or desires. Let's be honest. Churches want to make up rules and run things their own way. Denominations want to cling to one set of rules or a certain area of the Bible, or add something to the Bible, like a book written by a false prophet to add to the Word of God that was given from start to finish. I think what it comes down to oftentimes is folks want to live their lives the way they want to, and they want to shape the Word of God to fit the way they want to live. When I started, when I, when, I, when I had a first desire about 14 or 15 years ago to go to seminary, I, I almost went to a denominational seminary. However, the first thing they wanted to teach was not the Bible. They gave me a certain book, and I was supposed to learn it first. For me, that was a turnoff. I said, I, I want to learn the Word of God, not a, a, a man-written book of opinions. So I left and I went, I ended up going to a non-denominational Bible seminary. I think what we want oftentimes is to do things our way and ask God, just cut us a little slack. Give us an A for effort, even if we haven't gotten into the Word. We want God's stamp of approval based on our opinions, not based on His Word. Oftentimes, I think the reason we don't want to get in the Word is we don't think we can live up to God's expectations. It's kind of like having that mentor. You don't think you can ever live up to their standards. Sometimes we don't think we can really use God's Word as a measuring stick because we don't want to measure up. We, we want to keep this in our lives, but then we still want to be this person over here, too. Too hard, too much to expect. The excuse, well, times are changing. Things are different than they were back in those days. That's nothing new. That's exactly what Jesus was telling folks in John 8, 42. And I'm going to start there and read this to you this morning. This is our scripture text this morning. If you guys can put it up there for us. But in the book of John, 8 chapter, 42nd verse, listen to this. Jesus said to them, he's talking to the Jews, because remember, the Jews, that was a religion of a lot of rules, a lot of man-made rules and traditions. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God, and now I'm here. I have, I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why do you not believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Then the Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, Jesus said, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it. And he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. You see, the Jews were trying to defend their man-made traditions, the things that they had made up. They wanted to keep what was comfortable to them. Because we're all like that. We fall into our comfort zone. They wanted to keep what was comfortable to them. 
They thought that they were pleasing God by living by the traditions that they had made up in their religion. What they wanted were the things that they wanted. They wanted their opinions to be their rules. And then they found out that Jesus just told them, Jesus just told them, you can't do that. Jesus said a lot of what they believed, he was telling them a lot of what they had learned was not based on the truth, the word of God. And they didn't like what they heard. And I think in today's society, we find the same thing, either with ourselves or even more so with a lot of others we see out there. When, when there's a, an opinion or a belief and we find out that the word of God says something different, we either want to ignore it, change it, or just pretend it doesn't exist. And that can happen in all kinds of circles. Like when a political opinion is in contrast to the word of God, then we say, well, we have to separate the politics and the Bible or religion. But the fact is, if something varies from the word of God, it's not the truth, it's a lie. Because there is no two ways about it. And Jesus draws a line in it. If it opposes the word of God, it's not the truth. That's why in our scripture text to today, when Jesus stands up and checks the Jews, they didn't like it. And when they didn't like what they heard, they didn't like the messenger. But it didn't matter. Jesus continued to draw a bold line between the truth and their lies. But don't be fooled, because he still does the exact same thing today. There's a bold line it's either on the right side or the wrong side. And there's a scripture text that has always stuck out in my mind. And years ago, Brother Doug that I mentioned earlier, we were having one of our debates. And he told me one day, he was teasing, he said, you know, you're just a red-letter Christian. You just want to take everything just like it's printed. And I said, well, of course. He goes, it's all in how you interpret it. I said, you can't interpret it. He goes, where in the Bible does it say you can't interpret it? I said, well, if you go to 1 Corinthians 4, 6, in the last half of the verse, it says, do not go beyond what is written. And he, we had a great conversation. He said, man, you're right. We got to talking about it. See, that scripture text in itself shoots holes in personal beliefs and interpretations. It can shoot holes in entire denominational books. Do not go beyond what is written. And in that scripture text I read a moment ago in the 8th chapter of John, Jesus cuts to the chase in what he's saying. Everything God has said is a true, and everything Satan says is a lie. Jesus lets them know if it isn't from God, then it's from Satan. And the greatest weapon, do you know what the greatest, I know you've heard me say this, do you know what the greatest weapon that Satan has in this world is? Anybody want to take a stab at it? What is the greatest weapon that Satan has? I know whatever comes on our minds, because it used to come on mine first all the time. We'd say temptation, right? Greatest weapon Satan has is temptation. Because if we can get tempted, then maybe he can get us to do what? Sin. I used to think that was the greatest. And in seminary, we learned something a little different when we got into the Word. He said the greatest weapon that Satan has is distorting the truth. You think about it, because if he can distort the truth, then you don't get the message that God gave you. Did you ever think about that? How can change occur in your life if you don't know the truth? The head of the seminary, Dr. McDaniel, said this one day, and he took it extreme, and it was kind of one of a little ground shaking for some of us. He said, so if Satan wants to distort the message so you don't get the truth, then the change that God desires in your life is not going to happen. And then he went on to say this. I'm going to take it even further. He said, I'm going to scare every one of you. He said, how do you receive salvation? Well, by faith in Jesus Christ, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. He said, so what if... Satan can distort that message, and you think that there is something that you have to do to add to what Christ has freely offered you. 
He said, what if you think there's a ceremony you have to participate in? There's something that you physically have to do to receive salvation or to keep your salvation. He said, if that message is distorted, ask yourself this question, are you really saved? If you think there's something you have to add to what Jesus did, then is it really salvation? That was a question. The point he was making was, if Satan can distort the message, then he distorts the results that God wants to get out of it. The greatest weapon that Satan has is a lie to distort the message of God. And I'll tell you what else he'll do. If he can't distort the message, he will attack the messenger. If he can't get you to give a false message, then he'll attack the message. And everybody that's probably ever served in church will find out if he can't change your message, he's going to come at you. That's what he's always done since day one. If he can't distort the message, he's got to go for the messenger. And that's what they did to Jesus in that verse. Because they didn't like him because they couldn't change his message to what they wanted to hear. See, God has a message. But unfortunately, there are a lot of folks who think we need to soften up or water down the word. So it's not offensive. But the scripture is clear. You're either a friend of God or you're an enemy of God. You either walk in the word with God or you walk without God. You either allow the word of God to educate you as God designed for it to or you follow the path of the world. And it sounds harsh, but God did not give us a book of suggestions and ideas. He gave us his word. And in James 4, 4, it says this, You adulterous people, you do not know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You see, the word of God is saying, you've got to pick a side. You either live by the world's standards or you try to live by mine. And God knows you're not going to live perfectly. But he knows you have to try to live by his standards. Because the world's opinions do not measure up to God's truth. The world, especially the world that we live in today, doesn't want to be told the truth. The world wants to make up its own rules. Satan wants to make up the rules. Oftentimes the world will lash out at the truth just like they were lashing out to Jesus when he told them the truth. What did Jesus say in John 15? So just a few chapters later, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Because he brought the truth. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. There is no getting it both ways. It's either God or it isn't. You can't mix the ingredients together. I've learned this when I was in college and I first started cooking for myself. You can't mix up a bunch of bread dough and throw the jambalaya in it and expect something good to come out. You can't mix up two different... She's laughing. She's from Louisiana. She knows. We do mix a lot of bad stuff into one pot, but it's got the ingredients all have to be the same. In order to receive what God is offering you, in order to receive the change that God wants to have in your life, in order to receive the direction that God has for you, you've got to have the truth. And you've got to have your mind right. You have to be spiritually minded. You have to be open. Boy, that's a tough one. The older we get, sometimes the more closed-minded we get. Now, not me, but other folks. Get closed-minded and don't want to change. Don't say amen, Larry. <laughs> but we have to be open to the message that God has that he wants to change in our lives. The truth of God's word is you have to take it and embrace it as he gives it. When I, the very first seminary lesson we had, we were told this. It said, 
if this is really going to work, you need to take all your opinions, all your preconceived notions and everything and put it aside and come with a blank slate and get ready to receive the word as God gives it. You see, there's no such thing as personal or individual truth. The truth is in the word of God. And in 2 Peter, uh, first chapter, 20th verse says, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of the scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then in Psalm 119, 160, it says, All your words are true, all your righteous laws are eternal. That means taking God's word at face value. No interpretation is needed. Literally. In 2 Timothy, it says this in the second chapter, 15th verse, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Mike and I had this discussion. He was telling me about in, uh, when he was a, a detective. They had a policy and procedure manual. How many pages was it, Mike? Pages. 675 pages of policies and procedures to operate and function correctly in the police department. God has given us the original policy and procedure manual for life. To do the job that God wants you to do, you need to know the policies and procedures. You need to know what he has for you. To be changed into the person that God wants you to be, you've got to know what it is God wants. And the only way to know is to read and to find out. You see, what God desires is he desires that you embrace his loving word. And I'll tell you how it's going to change you and how you're going to understand it. The moment you receive salvation, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what the, what the Spirit does is it takes the Word of God inside of you and it gives it meaning in your life. And it begins to show you how to change. Just like Brother Mike was talking about, we talk about a lot of times at the end of a day, we reflect back on the day of mistakes we've made or, or situations that we didn't handle as we feel God would have wanted us to have. So we pray about it. And tomorrow is an opportunity to grow and respond more like God wants us to. But we have to have the word to correct us and to direct us. To have the change in our lives that God desires. You go to the word of God and you let it impact your life. You let it lead you. Just like I told the kids, you let it answer the questions that you have. And the cool thing about it is today... Man, 25 years ago, we would dig through the Bible and dig and dig and dig until we could find the scripture text to answer the problem. Now you can just get on your phone and Google the question, and it'll take you right to the verse in the Bible. Now we don't even have an excuse for not looking it up. But you got to remember from the beginning of time through eternity, God's word doesn't change. It doesn't get watered down. He's given you the truth from the beginning to eternity. Remember in Revelation 22, 13, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he's giving you his word from the beginning all the way through eternity. God has given us an unchanging truth from the time he created the world until the time that we go to live in the kingdom of heaven with God. But the word of God is so important to us right now in the middle because it teaches us the direction, the path, and the change that God desires in our lives. And that's where we go to the word because it's the truth about everything. Amen. Brother. Peace, peace, wonder. Coming down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever. I pray in. Faith.
fathomless billows of love. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweet Amen. And Clint, brother, we sure appreciate you, you know, taking over for Carl this week, doing a great job, and the band, awesome as always. It's just amazing. I can't believe y'all don't get together and practice during the week. Is that right? <laughs> well, y'all are a blessing and incredible ministry. Amen. Amen. I want to thank all y'all for being here this morning. Of course, we want to say good morning to Carl. We miss, we actually missed Carl this morning. Look forward to seeing you back next week, along with other people that are traveling and gone out of town. But, y'all, we're so blessed to be able to come together and, and worship and praise God as we, as we feel. And I, I just ask you, invite others. There's a lot of others in our community that feel empty, that aren't going to church, that don't have a church family. Invite them to church because it, it's just such a blessing to have folks that care for each other. And, and one announcement I forgot earlier is the, uh, the outreach ministry is going to be putting up a bulletin board in the back. That, that part of our offering goes to help people in the community, and we want you to be able to go in and look and read and see exactly what all that group has done in the community and the, the incredible impact it has on people's lives. And if y'all would, please bow with me in prayer. Father, we're so blessed to have been in your house today. Father, I prayed that we left everything at the door. We came in here to receive your word and your message. And I thank you every week, Lord, for giving me a message. It's never mine. It's always yours. I want to thank you for the incredible gospel music we have provided by these gentlemen up here every week. The incredible family members that we have that reach out to each other, that pray for each other, that serve each other during the week. Father, I want to pray for our state and our country, the men and women that serve in law enforcement, our first responders, our border patrol. I want to pray for those that serve in our government. I want to praise the Lord that all those that seek direction seek it from your word. I want to pray that we lift up our teachers and our students, folks that are at home. I pray, Lord, that if there's a lost person out there, that they hear the message today and they receive your son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior. Father, I pray that you use each one of us to lead others to your son, to lead others to you. Father, use each one of us as part of your ministry and part of your kingdom building. We want to thank you for the talents and the blessings that you've given each one of us in our lives. Pray that we use it for the betterment of your kingdom. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. Take nothing for my journey now. Gotta make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts me and he tries to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name, all the wealth that I want, world of fame. If I could. 
but still it wouldn't take nothing for the Lord to die. Well, I started out traveling for the Lord many years ago. I had a lot of heartache, had a lot of crumbling woe. When I would stumble, that's when I would humbly bow down. Thank God I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Got to make it to heaven somehow. Though the devil tempts me and he tries to turn me around. He's offered everything that's got a name. All the wealth that I want, worldly fame. If I could steal, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Still, it wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. 